everybody, and um, it's really a huge honor to, to be speaking here today. I'm fully aware that um, so much of the research I've been able to do is as a direct consequence of initiatives uh, like this. Now, uh, as many of you know, privacy has been front page news for at, at least this past week and for many weeks before. I'm not going to dwell on all of these cases, but those of you who, who read the news are sure to have uh, bumped into them. But rather, I want to um, look at, I hope, I hope you can read this. Um, I want you to look at the many ways, the much uh, broader ways in which um, information technology, IT, and digital media have been connected to the issue of privacy. And I would say that in all those wonderful imaginings that we were asked to do this morning, I couldn't help sitting there and thinking, maybe they're also nightmares. Uh, you know, pervasive sensory networks, uh, GPS and mobile devices, location sensing, all of these technologies um, that bring wonderful things at the same time um, threaten and violate privacy. Database technologies which uh, have been with us uh, for, you know, uh, 60 years, uh, tremendous capacities to store, to aggregate, um, whether actual aggregations or virtual aggregations, the capacity to mine, uh, you know, we, we, I'm sure we're going to hear the word big data many times today. Um, and of course, the communications networks, the uh, capacity to distribute, to disseminate, to share, to speak to one another, to speak to the world, have, have increased tremendously. So you might ask, why are these privacy problems? Why is it that all these uh, technical systems, technical devices, why, what, what are the triggers? What is it that makes people look at particular systems and be concerned and say, oh my God, my privacy is threatened, my privacy is violated? What is it that's being violated? And of course, you know, as a philosopher, I'm inclined, and I think we can't get away from this question of trying to understand what it is that privacy is that is being violated. And I've argued, and I, I want us to assume going forward in, in just the next 10 or so minutes, that privacy should not be understood as secrecy. It's not the case that any release of information is problematic from a privacy point of view. And I would also dissuade us from thinking of privacy as control over information, suggesting that the only time we can attain privacy that's meaningful to us is to have, for every individual to have full control over information. If that's what privacy is, then I can't see that we, we are a, we're going to be able to promote the cause of privacy. And so I would like to suggest that privacy is about appropriate flow of information and revisit some of those technologies, again, with that in mind, to understand what it is about those technologies that has um, made us concerned about our privacy. And what I suggest is that the feature of those technologies is that they're disruptive. They disrupt information flows in radical ways so that information flows resulting from their use can be inappropriate and hence raise the concern of privacy. And so I classified these uh, technologies in, into three, uh, th it's really three dimensions um, that you can identify in various systems. One, tech, IT and digital media have made us really, really good at obtaining information, at monitoring, at tracking, at placing people under surveillance, at capturing emanations uh, of information from, you know, even heat emanations, smells and, and visual um, information. It's made us tremendously good at utilizing information, storage, aggregation, analysis of information, statistical techniques, the sciences, all the way, hardware, all the way up to um, 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 st uh, statistical methods. And of course, uh, IT and digital media uh, make us very much better at distributing information, communications, dissemination, disclosure, uh, web 2.0, social networks, and so forth. 
Now, you might say, all right, we have these privacy problems. What kind of a problem is privacy, and where should we look for solutions? So some might argue, and I know um, scientists and engineers, uh, many of you here in this room, uh, come in many different stripes. Some of you say, leave me alone, I'm a scientist. Uh, you're the philosopher, you're the social scientist, you worry about privacy and, and uh, le let me just get on and, and design my systems. Um, they say this is a political problem having to do with the relationship between government and citizen. They say it's a public social issue because it has to do with uh, people interacting in society and our social institutions. These are the problems of privacy, and this is where the solution should be. In other words, they throw the privacy problem over the fence. <laughs> now, there have been many scientists and engineers who've said, no, this, this, it's thoroughly a scientific and engineering problem too, because it's, it is because of our science and engineering that these problems have arisen, and we should also be involved, it should be an integral part of what we do as scientists and engineers, and there have been technologists in the fray who have seen it as their responsibility as, not just as, as citizens, but as scientists and engineers to be involved in these problems. So um, I like to even think of the definition that evolved in the 1970s of security, where confidentiality was one of the pillars of security, confidentiality and aspects of privacy. And in 1984, I recall reading about the computer matching, deba uh, computer matching debate, whether it's a good or bad thing, and I think, you know, given big data and, you know, aggregation of mining, what a quaint argument to be having at that time. But the CACM published that because they thought scientists and engineers would be interested in it. We all may have remembered the crypto wars and the cypherpunk manifesto. So there is a history, computer scientists saying, we're not throwing it over the wall, we're coming over to join you, you know, we're looking over the fence. And so I want to talk a little bit about what I think of as three waves that we've experienced um, in, in this increasing integration. And I, I would, I highlight that the R&D agencies have been essential to developing this increasing integration of the science and engineering on the one hand and the humanistic and uh, social scientific analysis on the other hand. Now in the first wave, I want to uh, um, draw attention to, to programs within the funding agencies that enabled uh, people like myself to study social and ethical issues that directly uh, uh, evolved as a result of developments in science and technology. We were separate, but we did our work because we were interested in the implications of science and, techno uh, science and technology. In wave two, uh, I would identify the kind of funding that was being done as LC. Uh, some of you may know the acronym, but ethical, legal, social implications of of uh, technology, and uh, many, many in the biological uh, areas, especially uh, the genome and, and cloning and so on, uh, there was concern about this, and so uh, we, we find that uh, the agencies would fund a very big project and they would say, you also have to have a little ELSI component devoted to this particular project that you're involved in. And uh, this was also very productive. And Wave three, uh, which I feel we're in at the moment um, in relation to uh, this, this um, integration of science and technology with the issue of privacy, is where scientists and engineers um, consider privacy as a clarion call. They're interested in developing technical systems with other functionalities, but also interested in considering what to do about privacy within those projects, and at also interested in having privacy-inspired technologies, which is to say developing technologies that would assist in protecting privacy. And as a, as a result of uh, Wave 3 um, funding in, uh, through the R&D agencies, which is, you know, to encourage this greater integration of privacy and IT, uh, we've seen tremendous um, 
uh, developments, and I, I don't, are you, can you read this? I, uh, okay, great. Over there, look over there. Uh, and, and I'm not going to go through all of this. I, I, I will pull out just a few things um, that are of particular interest to me. First of all, um, at, at the level of, say, language and logics, we have richer formal, the development of richer formal languages to expand our capacity for much more nuanced access to databases. It's not, yes, you can have access, no, you can't, but, but, but things that are much more closely related to the functionality that you want out of that database, be it a health information database or a supply chain database. Um, we're developing metrics in the science of information, like differential privacy, that allow us to express um, in more nuanced ways whether, for example, the release of a, a database meets those uh, metrics. We're developing techniques like blurring uh, visual information or obfuscatory techniques that allow us to reveal information for certain functionalities without giving everything away. We have a whole bunch of privacy preserving whatever. Not, so we have people who are working on privacy preserving data mining so that we can extract the useful information maybe like in patients like me, we can extract what we need from a medical point of view without having to know what this particular individual had and holding them to account. Privacy preserving location-based mobile services, I feel like there's some really exciting work going on in that area. Anonymization, which has been um, both uh, interesting and, and maybe impossible, uh, human-centered usable uh, privacy, which is very important, and of course, uh, economics uh, is, 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 is a necessary component of all of this. Now, what makes these privacy solutions, if we go back to this notion of privacy as appropriate flow and worrying about the disruptions, because the disruptions are not bad always, the, the, the disruptive flows can be exactly what brings progress into society, but um, what some of these privacy solutions are doing is that they're, they're constraining flows, they're uh, preventing flows, they're containing information, they're modulating in very nuanced ways. And that's what uh, this third wave of technologies uh, uh, and, and um, activities, the research activities are doing. And what uh, I just want to spend a few minutes now, or oh, I don't have a few minutes, I have one minute. <laughs> talking about, uh, you know, looking ahead. What is the way for? Well, first of all, I want to say, continue waves one, two, and three. The, uh, the, these are all producing uh, outstanding work. But I would like to see a movement towards a, a better understanding of the concept of privacy so that what we're protecting is not simply, say, secrecy, but something that's meaningful. So I'm, I'm trying to understand what it is that people value in privacy and aiming towards a meaningful appreciation of, of, of privacy. And um, I believe that we will need greater hybridity in the work that we're doing, greater hybridity among various uh, areas of science and technology and along with those who are trained in humanities and social sciences, looking at the way privacy is achieved, not just in this widget or that widget, but in a system as a whole, and so we would need better coordination also at the application area to understand also what can be done by the technology, where it needs to be handed off to the social and policy realm, and vice versa. What's better done uh, by technology and not to place as much pressure on the policy realm and so forth. So better coordination is what I um, look forward to in this wave four, and then we'll be there. Thank you. One of the challenges that, that I often see is, is, in fact, the challenge of cultural diversity. Uh, and it's manifest in many axes. One, of course, is generational, but the other is international. 
And it brings a whole set of issues that are not only cultural perspectives, but in fact a challenge that one may not even be able to find a mutually legally acceptable solution for privacy when you have multiple parties at work. What are your thoughts about how that's going to evolve with this collision of culture and technology? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, 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 now I have to answer a little bit in, in terms of my own uh, work on contextual integrity and privacy because um, privacy, uh, some people would argue that people care less about privacy or more about privacy in different cultures and different age groups. I think that's absolutely false. We all care about privacy, but if you understand privacy as appropriate flow, which is defined in social terms and, and responds to certain um, underlying needs, like what is the result of inappropriate flow? Is it harm? Is it disadvantage? Is it the breakdown of social institutions? It makes a lot of sense that there would be differences. So when we aim for privacy, we must look below to understand what the, what the flows are that are desirable for a particular culture, for a particular age group, and that's what we, we need to aim for. I'm, I'm not saying that the answers are, are easy, but we all care about privacy. What that actually means in concrete terms is uh, a variety of, of results. Yes, um, I'm an attorney, and uh, I approach things from a different perspective than I gather, and I appreciate your, the human-centered perspective that you do. But in the business community, you enter into non-disclosure agreements, you have trade secrets, you have important things you keep that you really don't want to share with others for very basic economic reasons. And there is a crossover sometimes between that and the protections for the human. You, know, you even have a legal person, if you want to look at the corporate structure as a legal person, that perhaps it's possible to learn from the other. And if there's technical approaches adopted, and I see this from my work with uh, the, the engineering community for you know, managing information at the, uh, the data structure level, that the actual methods of protection, you might find ways of um, a crossover between the two. So in your research, um, from your perspective, uh, do you actually reach out to the other communities to uh, share, share notes? Uh, I'm not sure which other communities. Do you mean uh, the, the, copy, the um, property rights? Well, you, you're not just property rights, but you also have banking. And uh, they started off with copyright. I could right. go into detail, right. but I won't. Right. No, no, I know, but now there's so many other industries. They have right. NDAs and trade secrets and right. you know, the pharmaceutical communities. They want to make sure if they're manufacturing in right. China that it's the actual integral right. thing that's come back. You know, it's not something that's been uh, changed along the route. Right. Right, so, so I'm, uh, first of all, I'm, um, I don't want us to think about privacy as a property right, and I know that's not what you were trying to get at. But I do want to really highlight something important that you said. Many people would say things like privacy is not important because if you've got nothing to hide, if you've done nothing wrong, you shouldn't need it. And what all these, inst these legal institutions, these legal um, um, protections, like trade secrets, the, the fact that society is willing to protect someone's trade secret, that we have rules against insider trading. These all suggest that society and the institutions that society is made up of depend on constraints on the flow of information. And likewise, in the case of privacy, it's not about you hiding these bad things about yourself, but it's what is appropriate to share in an environment in order to sustain not only your own benefit, but in order to, to sustain certain social institutions. And there's been you know, excellent work on the social value of privacy, and I think that those kinds of institutions that you mentioned um, indicate why constraints on flow are important, not just to protect you against uh, bad stuff that you've done before. 